Okay, you guys. Today, we're going to talk about the end of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. This is pretty exciting because if you think about it, we've been talking about the Soviet Union since probably September now. And we've been talking about the Cold War since November. But now, finally, it is coming to a close. And all the tensions and all the terribleness that we've been talking about for so long, it is <clears throat> now ending. So we're going to talk a little bit about just what's going on in the world leading up to it. And then we're going to talk about the factors that ended the Soviet Union, both externally and internally. And then just a little bit about some of the problems that these new nations faced. So let's dive in, shall we? All right. So first of all, a little bit of a, of a review. And honestly, for these first few slides, these are general review. So if you're looking at this and you're thinking, this dove, I know all this. I don't need to hear about it again then you can just kind of zone out for a little bit, take in what you want, um, but you don't need to write this stuff down. Now, if you're looking at this and you're saying, Miss Dove, are you sure we learned this? Then yeah, you probably want to write this down. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so a little bit of review. The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, also known as the Soviet Union. As we know, it's founded in 1922 after the Russian Revolution that was led by Lenin in 1917. Remember all that good peace land bread? Then they have a civil war. And then finally in 22, the Soviet Union is founded. Now the Soviet Union is actually 15 socialist states, socialist republics. Russia is the largest one. So that's why it's kind of synonymous with the Soviet Union. We also know that these 15 Soviet socialist republics ruled by Russia and Moscow, we know that they're totalitarian. So again, the government has total control. People have limited to no freedom, um, lots of censorship, indoctrination, a lot of brutality, good times unless you were there. We also know that the Cold War, we know this is much more of an ideological war um, because Soviet Union and America never fight. Instead, they divide the globe into American and Soviet allies, with the exception, of course, non-aligned nations that remain neutral. Um, and we also know that because of the Cold War and its 50-odd year reign, um, despite the fact that America and Soviet Union never fight, we see lots of wars and interferences crop up time and time again. So Korea, Vietnam, the coups in Iran and Chile, as well as all the uh, interventions in Latin America and the Middle East and Africa. So briefly about the Cold War. Now, what else is going on that we need to kind of reinforce our knowledge of? We need to remember that in the 1980s, the tensions of the Cold War reemerge. If you remember in class the other day, I said that these tensions, they get real bad, and then they kind of ease off for a bit, and then they get bad, and then they ease off. Well, up until the end of the Cold War, just about, the tensions get worse. Um, so in the early 1980s, detente, which remember is that lessening of tensions, that dies. By 1980, detente is done. And that's for two main factors. First of all, we have SALT II, which is the strategic arms limitation talks. The second one totally fails. Now, the first one was great. In 72, um, <clears throat> Nixon and Brezhnev, they got together. They decided to reduce their arms. And then Carter, the American president, and the Soviet premier, whose name I'm fully blanking on, I'm going to say Andropov, but I'm pretty sure that's wrong. They meet to talk about reducing arms. But unlike the previous one, they can't agree. America's like, Soviet Union, reduce to this amount. And Soviet Union's like, no, America, you reduce to that amount. And finally, they're like, we're done. We're never going to agree. It's so sad. We hate each other. Um, also, in that same year, Soviet Union decides to start a central war in Asia, which we know is never a good idea, by invading Afghanistan, which is major country um, south of the Soviet Union. Why are they doing this? Because they want to expand their influence. They want to take over the rest of Asia. If the Soviet Union can expand, then it can go west into the Middle East and expand its influence. And it can potentially go east and encircle China. Because remember, Soviet Union and China hate each other now, and Soviet Union wants to show China that they are truly the most powerful communist nation. So with that invasion um, and the failure of SALT II, detente is done, and America and Soviet Union hate each other. In fact, the Soviet Union is known in America as the evil empire, which is also the excellent um, album by a really great rock band in the 90s called Rage Against the Machine. Highly recommend you checking them out. If you're into political rock, they're your band. Um, because SALT II has failed and because America and Soviet Union are refusing to build fewer uh, nuclear weapons, 
fears of nuclear holocaust are pretty massive. And you get awesome movies like Red Dawn and The Day After. Um, and a lot of really paranoid 80s mu movies um, about the fears of what will happen when we all die because of nuclear weapons. So that's happening. It's real fun being in the 80s. <clears throat> the other thing that's happening in the 1980s is America is intervening all over Latin America. They are going to secretly interfere with Nicaragua by selling arms to the anti-communist forces. And America is actually even going to invade Granada and Panama. So again, America really not feeling the Soviet Union, really um, not wanting communism to spread. So again, that containment policy. Um, so we're going to see America um, take that to action with lots of invasions. Okay. What else is happening in the 1980s? The Middle East. We just talked about it last week, but we want to recap because we're thinking more globally now. It's not just a regional conflict, but the end of the Cold War is truly global. So as we know, the Middle East, Iran, which just had their Islamic, um, or just had their revolution and turned into the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, controlled by the Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, Iran is trying to dominate the region. They want to be the most powerful Islamic state. It's basically Iran versus Saudi Arabia. Although before that, it's going to be Iran versus Iraq in the 1980s. Um, we know that there's a lot of conflicts that occur in the 1980s. Lebanon is going to have a major civil war um, within its own country, which is going to lead to a lot of death and devastation. As I just said, Iran and Iraq are going to fight um, over the border. That's going to be a really terrible war. It's going to last for about eight years. Um, and lead to more than a million casualties um, and be really devastating for the peoples in both countries. Fun fact, America, um, again with those interventions, America is going to secretly support both countries. So we're going to sell arms and weapons to Iraq, who's headed by a man named Saddam Hussein, um, as well as Iran, who um, has basically been like death to America um, and actually um, <clears throat> held several of our own American citizens hostage for 444 days um, following the um, Iranian revolution. But despite that, America's still going to sell both of them weapons and arms. Why would America do this? Well, because if they destroy each other, then that makes America's life a lot easier. Um, and when you sell weapons to other countries, you make money. So it's a win-win for America. Fun little shady aside there about this lovely country, which I do love. It's a great country. Um, but it's important to note that uh, we've done some weird stuff. All right. Um, speaking of America, we can't talk about the Middle East if we don't mention Israel. Um, I think I said that right. We can't mention America if we don't talk about Israel. We're talking about the Middle East. So lots of conflicts emerging there. Um, we're going to see the first Palestinian Intifada, which is an uprising. It's actually pretty initially peaceful uprising of the Palestinian people, um, which will then turn pretty violent um, and lead to a lot of conflict in the region. Um, and as I've said, there's a lot of anti-American sentiment, largely due to America's continued support of Israel, as well as perhaps the shady things that America's doing by selling arms to both countries at war. Another region to, um, that we've been talking about is going to be Africa. Um, Africa, by the 1980s, is going to be completely decolonized of foreign influence. There are a couple of states that are now kind of colonies of themselves. So like Namibia is actually a colony of South Africa until I think like 91. Um, Morocco is going to control Western Sahara actually to this day. But the rest of the continent is totally independent of European influence. Um, even though they're totally independent, we're still going to see a lot of um, political and economic issues. So those legacies of colonialism, once again, are going to continue to persist. But we are starting to see growth. We're starting to see change. Um, literacy rates are improving. Education's improving. We're starting to see technological developments. And Africa is growing. And actually, some of the countries, like Nigeria, South Africa, etc., um, are actually going to have really strong economic gains. So, you know, signs of hope. Other regions. Latin America, which we've talked about a little bit um, <clears throat> with America. United States having a greater role. Um, but the rest of the region, we're actually seeing a lot of economic growth, a lot of political change, um, thinking about building on the connections economic um, that we see nowadays. So we're going to see our larger countries geographically, but also economically. Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil um, are going to dominate the regions, both in Central and South America. They're going to see a lot of um, strong leaders, lots of growth, um, 
which is going to be good. However, it's often going to be at the expense of civil liberties. So you might be able to put more food on your table, but you might not be able to say something bad about the government. So you win some, you lose some. But, uh, you know, we're definitely seeing growth, which, you know, is not bad. And then finally, the last region that we've been talking about is going to be Asia. Asia, we're going to see a lot of economic growth. Asia is going to start to become really, really economically dominant, which is a pattern that we see persisting to this day. Why? Because we see a lot of industrial growth, a lot of manufacturing. If you look at your clothes and a lot of your own things, um, you're going to see made in Taiwan, made in China, made in Korea, etc. Uh, we have what's known as the Asian Tigers, which are the economies of Korea, South Korea, um, Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, and later China, um, that are really just going to be very super dominant and continue, um, like I said, into the 21st century. Oops. All right. So that's kind of our review of what's going on. Now let's start to talk about what leads to the end of the Soviet Union um, <clears throat> to kind of continue these patterns. And first, we're going to talk about the satellite states. Now, what are the satellite states? Hopefully, when I say that, you're thinking, this stuff, we know what the satellite states are. You don't need to tell us again. But just in case, I'm going to review it because I'm just, just, you know, having a thought here. All right, so satellite states. These are going to be independent countries in Eastern Europe. It's going to be Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, and Poland. So technically they're independent, technically they're their own countries. Um, they're not part of the Soviet Union. We'll talk a little bit more about them on the next slide. They should not be confused with the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR countries. These are going to be the countries within the Soviet Union. So in Eastern Europe, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, Southwest Asia, um, Azerbaijan, Armenia. Actually, I guess that's really where Ukraine is. Azerbaijan, etc. And then all of your stands down here in Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Tur uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan. Uh, there's another stand that I think we've missed there. Um, so those are going to be your social, um, USSR countries. And then, of course, Russia, which is all of this. All right, let's talk about the satellite states a little bit more. So as we know, they're independent nations in Eastern Europe here. Um, they are controlled economically and politically by the Soviet Union. So if you remember way back long ago when we learned about the Molotov plan, the Warsaw Pact, and everyone's favorite Comic-Con. So when the Soviet Union is extending its political and economic influence over the region. Um, despite the fact that these are independent nations, they have little economic or political freedoms, which is so sad for them. Um, and then we see that evidenced by the uprisings in Hungary in 1956 and the Prague Spring of 1968, in which these leaders in these countries, Hungary and Czechoslovakia, thought, hey, I have a great idea. Let's, like, I don't know, have some freedoms, try out some aspects of democracy. And the Soviet Union then literally rolled in in tanks and put down, um, put down these uprisings. Um, the latter one is going to be um, <clears throat> given its own reason for it, and that's the Brezhnev Doctrine, which is basically the Soviet Union saying, we have the right to put down any dissidents and remove any opposition that we don't like, um, even if it's not within the Soviet Union, um, and we're going to employ that in places like Prague Spring. So that's a little background on the satellite states. Let's talk about the actual end of the Soviet Union, the factors for it. Don't worry, we'll come back to the satellite states. But before we do that, we want to understand what's going on in the Soviet Union. Because in the 1980s, the economy starts to tank. It gets real bad. Um, which is actually pretty surprising because in the 1950s and 60s, the Soviet Union was actually just as good, if not better in some respects, than America. Um, their economy was massively booming. All those five-year plans of Stalin um, actually were pretty successful, but they were not sustainable because when you put all your resources into building um, industrial output, into building machines for warfare, um, into building nuclear weapons, et cetera, et cetera, that's great for the short term, but it doesn't exist long term. And in fact, the negative effects far outweigh the initial benefits, which is unfortunately what the Soviet Union experienced. Um, there are other uh, factors, other <clears throat> aspects that kind of ruin their economy. The war in Afghanistan is a huge drain 
Um, it's a really devastating, horrible war that Soviet Union does not win, um, but it lasts for about nine years. Um, Soviet Union is just basically trying to take over Afghanistan and failing, um, but they can't they can't succeed. Um, it's kind of like their Vietnam. Um, it's just a terrible, horrible war that they get stuck into. And the longer they're in it, the harder it is for them to get out of it. And it's one of those that like, well, we can't leave until we win, but they can't win. And instead just leads to a lot of death and devastation. Um, that's actually partly due to America um, because we secretly um, help the Afghanis. But um, I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, also with America, because detente fails, because salt fails, um, the Soviet Union as well as America are still building tons of more weapons. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but it's really expensive to build a nuclear weapon. Uh, so the Soviet Union, they're going to spend all their money on that as opposed to things like hospitals and healthcare and roads and education and things that people actually need for their day-to-day -day life. Um, <clears throat> oh, good reminders. Um, so that's also going to impact their economy. And when your government is spending all their money on nuclear weapons and not on things like hospitals and healthcare and roads and education, um, you're probably not going to be a very effective worker. You're going to be pretty bitter about it. Now that you can say that because, you know, all the um, authoritarian rule. So there's little industrial output. And then finally, just lovely little topping here at the end. Uh, there's a lot of internal regional conflicts that the Soviet Union is also being impacted by. So it's just a bad stew of badness for the Soviet Union in the 1980s. Their economy, it's just, it's not going to continue. Um, and it's one of the major factors that leads to the end of the Soviet Union. Um, the other thing to note is when we start in these next few slides, start looking and seeing what's going on with the satellite states. Um, we're going to remember this because when the satellite states start rebelling, the Soviet Union cannot respond. They don't have the resources. And that's a direct result of this economic decline. All right, so let's talk about these satellite states. First one we're going to talk about is Poland. Oh, Poland. Poland, as we know, has had such a sadly unique history. Um, we know that it existed. Um, and then it didn't exist for 100 years. And then following World War I, we know that it was created once again, uh, which is great. But then it pretty much was overwhelmed by Germany. And then um, after the war, it was occupied the Soviets. I think they maybe had like two days of freedom. Um, but then pretty much they were under control of the Soviet Union. That is until the 1980s. So in 1980, <clears throat> a bunch of shipyard workers... They're working these terrible long jobs in the shipyards, hauling in materials. It's pretty brutal. It's off the Baltic Sea. It's really cold and gross. Um, and these shipyard workers, they go to their market to buy their nightly food, and they see the price of beef has just skyrocketed. And Polish people, they love beef. It's their main food that they eat, beef and potatoes. And these guys are like, what is going on? We can't do this any longer. Our jobs suck. Everything sucks. We hate our lives. And now beef is too expensive. We're going on strike. We can't do it any longer. And they start striking. Um, initially, it's a trade strike. Um, so it's just the shipyard workers, which if they're striking, that means Poland can't import any of their goods, which then means all these other industries that rely on the goods being imported can't work. So it's going to clog up and kind of destroy the economy. So it has a large effect. Um, and they start going on strike. They're led by a man named Lech Valenza, who's up there talking to the people, um, and we're going to hear more about him on the next slide. But this movement, because it spreads and because of a couple of unique factors, um, it's going to be the first group that successfully protests against communism ever in the entire history of communism. Solidarity is the first successful group. Um, and this success is going to inspire the rest of Eastern Europe and be a major factor for the end of the Soviet Union. So let's look a little bit more about why this movement is successful, unlike so many previous ones. Um, what happens? So the trade union goes on strike, it spreads, like Valencia's out in the public being like, guys, we're going to keep striking, we're going to take down the government, we're going to bring in freedom, so it's great. So the Polish government, what do they do? They immediately outlaw the movement. If you're part of solidarity, you are going to jail. 
and that's what happens to Valencia as, as well as a lot of his colleagues. Um, the government's also going to impose martial law, which is military rule. So military is going to come in. They are going to start um, installing curfews, saying that people have to be in their homes at a certain time. They outlaw um, groups of people organizing together in public. So you can only be in groups of two or three at most. Anything more, you could potentially go to jail um, and try to basically contain this movement. But it can't be contained. <clears throat> the genie has left the bottle. And part of that is because of international support. Um, it's important to note that Poland is a largely Catholic country. It's one of the largest um, solely Catholic countries actually in the world. So this guy down here, anyone know who this is? Any guesses? Any guesses? That's Pope John Paul II. He's the head of the Catholic Church. Um, he hears of what's happening because Catholics in Poland talk to their Catholic friends outside of Poland who then talk to John Paul. It's probably more complicated than that, but I like to think it's like, you know, one person just calls their friend, who calls their friend, who then calls John Paul II. That probably is not how it happened, but it's a nice idea. Um, so anyhow, John Paul II, he gets word of this and he becomes inspired because he's all about peace, you know, he's all about freedom and whatnot and, and God. Um, and he spreads the message of the Polish people, of the Solidarity Movement. And now suddenly Catholics worldwide, and there are millions, more than a million Catholics worldwide, more than a billion Catholics, I think, actually. Maybe? I might be making that up. There's a lot of Catholics worldwide. They're all becoming aware of this. So no longer is this just a small protest movement in a town in Poland or even within an entire country. This is something that now the entire world is aware of. America's aware of it. Our president at the time, President Reagan, he's getting on TV talking about the Polish people and the Polish people's fight. So now we're seeing the power of media and the power of communication that this is not a protest that can be hidden away and quickly ignored because the world is literally watching. <clears throat> Which is going to lead to 1988. So by the end of the decade, Valencia has been in jail this entire time. But finally in 1988, the government can't maintain control any longer. The martial law that they imposed is not effective. People are still protesting. They're still being willing to put themselves um, out there and fight for democracy and fight for freedoms. So the government, they have to give in. They allow free elections. This is the first time in Polish history that they've had free elections. This is the first time in most of Eastern Europe that they've had free elections. It's the first time in more than 40 years that this region has experienced elections. And as I said, for some of them, it's the first time ever. This is monumental. This is a major, major world event. Lech Walesa is going to be elected president. Solidarity is going to be put in charge of the government, that political party. Um, Lech Walesa is going to win the Nobel Peace Prize, deservedly so. Um, and Poland is now going to be a democratic state for the first time ever in the entire Polish history. They now have democracy, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. It was just a number of shipyard workers who started protesting because of the price of beef. And that protest grew and grew and was able to change an entire government. As we're going to see, it's going to change even more than the Polish government. It's going to affect the rest of Eastern Europe and directly lead to the downfall of the Soviet Union and the Cold War, which is kind of amazing. All right, so let's see how other countries were affected by Poland. The next revolution or rebellion we're going to talk about is Czechoslovakia. It's known as the Velvet Revolution, which just sounds so nice. Why is it the Velvet Revolution? It's a peaceful protest. <clears throat> Sorry. In 1989, Václav Havel, who's a playwright. Actually, I think he wins the Nobel, he wins the Nobel um, Prize for Literature, and I think he might win for peace as well. Um, he takes to the streets with people. They've witnessed what's happened in Poland, and the Czechs decide we're going to do this for ourselves. And they start protesting, marching in the streets, um, demanding change, demanding political representation, demanding freedoms. The government, they can't do anything. They have to give in. They completely <laughs> retreat. They completely give up. Because nobody in Czechoslovakia is supporting the government. They're such a small minority. 
And the Soviet Union is not supporting them. As we talked about, the Soviet Union, their economy, they have no resources. They have no extra cash. So they can't. The Czechoslovakian government goes to Moscow and says, Moscow, we need help. And Moscow's like, you got to solve it on your own because we got nothing for you. By the end of the year, Vaclav Havel is elected president. And Alexander Dubček, we talked about him. Remember Dubček? He was the leader of Prague Spring. Back in 68, when he first led a protest to allow some democratic freedoms, Soviet Union literally rolls in in tanks and jails him. Alexander Dubček has been in jail all this time. But following this revolution, he's released from jail and he is returned to parliament and he gets to head up this new government with Václav Havel, which is kind of nice. It's a little validation for him. So Czechoslovakia, largely peaceful of a protest movement that brings political change. So now we've seen two governments in which the people have taken to the streets and the people have demanded change. Unfortunately, now we're going to see a somewhat different story, and that's going to be in Romania. <clears throat> so Romania is ruled by a terrible dictator by the name Nicolae Ceausescu. He is brutal. He will not allow any dissent, any disagreement, any opposition. Um, those people are immediately jailed, um, beaten, um, <clears throat> and you know, oftentimes put to death. Um, there's very little freedom um, because secret police are everywhere, so people are spying, so there's, it's a major culture of fear. Um, I actually had a friend in college who um, escaped Romania when she was six with her family. Like they, you know, put their lives on the line and um, escaped into the forests um, until finally they could make it west and then get to America where they sought asylum as political prisoners because if they had returned to Romania, um, they would have been jailed and potentially worse for trying to defy the government. So it's, you know, it's pretty real. Um, so Ceausescu is really brutal, really terrible, rules Romania throughout the 1980s um, until December 15th. Oh, what an interesting date. Um, in Timo Sorora, which is probably not how you say it, a bunch of protesters have gathered together just to kind of acknowledge what's going on in Czechoslovakia and Poland and perhaps advocate for a little bit of change themselves. Um, they're peaceful. They're just gathered there. They're singing protest songs. They're picnicking, um, you know, they're marching around, but it's totally peaceful. Unfortunately, a bunch of National Guard or armed um, individuals, um, they show up and open fire and thousands of people die. It's completely horrific. Um, the people of Romania are so upset by this that they decide we can't do this any longer. Um, <clears throat> you know, I don't care if I die. I'm not going to live in this country that brutalizes its own people so badly. Mass protests sweep across the nation. And within days, Ceausescu's hold on this nation completely crumbles. The army turns away from him. Um, and in fact, once um, Ceausescu realizes that the writing's on the wall, he's got to get out. He tries to flee the country, but he's caught by the army. They capture him. And on Christmas Day, they publicly execute him, as well as broadcasting it on national television, um, and they literally kill him, um, which is like a weird Christmas gift, I guess, for the people of Romania. It's like Santa came, and then we also killed Ceausescu. Yay! Happy Christmas. Um, but Romania has free elections in the following year. Um, it becomes a relatively democratic state, although you could argue how democratic they are right now. Um, and... You know, it's pretty good for them, although the economy is still struggling, unfortunately. Um, and so they still have to deal with some problems. But largely, we're seeing um, Romania get pretty positive. The rest of the region, um, similar stories. We see lots of protests in Bulgaria and Hungary and Yugoslavia. People taking to the street, demanding change, um, which is pretty monumental. These are largely popular Nonviolent protests, people marching and demonstrating. The power of nonviolent protests, I think, is really massive here, um, has been um, <clears throat> illustrated in Eastern Europe. 
We're really seeing change, not by people taking the street and starting wars and starting conflicts, by people taking the street and demanding change by saying they want change. Um, and that's really powerful. And it's definitely, I think, a lesson that's important to reflect upon. So we're going to see the effects of this um, <clears throat> and as we continue. But one of the reasons why they're so, success uh, so successful is because the Soviet Union can't maintain control. They don't have the resources to be able to control these satellite states any longer. <coughs> because I'm so sorry, I'm coughing so much. Um, so by the end of the decade, the satellite states are actually independent for the first time in some of their history, um, but independent for the first time in decades and decades. They're separate from the Soviet Union, which is pretty exciting. There's one satellite state we haven't talked about yet, really. What could it be? If you're thinking of East Germany, you are correct. And if you weren't, hopefully this flag is giving you a clue. Um, East Germany has kind of a different story because there's protests in East Germany and then East Germany no longer exists. So what happens? Germany reunifies. So as we know, German history, Germany's for many, many years, millennia even, they're a bunch of different Germanic states. And then we know Germany's unified under Otto von Bismarck in 1871. Good times. Um, <clears throat> then Germany's going to fight in World War I and World War II. And following World War II, Germany's going to be split. Remember, it's occupied by the British and the Americans um, and the French in the West, and then occupied by the Soviets in the East. Um, and this initial occupation turns into an official separation of the country. Um, West Germany is really prosperous. <coughs> they have so much um, industry and wealth and capitalism. East Germany, their economy is completely stagnated. It's like a stagnant pond. It's gross. Nothing's happening. It's really bad. Um, but unlike what we see in the rest of the satellite states in Eastern Europe, um, in East Germany, they're much more aware of what they're missing. And that's partly because there is some communication between East Germans and West Germans. Um, and also Berlin, which is the capital of uh, Western um, of East Germany, there's West Berlin, which is in the middle of East Germany. So there's a little bit of Western Europe in the middle of East Germany. So East Germans can see West Germans wearing their Levi's jeans, drinking their Coca-Cola, listening to their Madonna and Michael Jackson cassette tapes. It's really exciting. I'm not making it up. These are really things that people in East Germany were super bitter that they couldn't have access to. Um, so they're really aware of what they're not um, experiencing. And in 1989, we're going to see East Germans start protesting, just like we saw in Czechoslovakia and Poland um, and all these other nations. In addition, because Czechoslovakia and Hungary and um, <clears throat> other nations are turning independent, now East Germans have a chance to leave the country. They don't just have to try to go west, they can go south or east to get ultimately to Western Europe. So they're going to start to flee. Um, if you remember why the Berlin Wall is created, it's created because people in East Berlin try to go to West Berlin. So once they're in West Berlin, they can then go west. And the Berlin Wall is erected in 1961 to prevent people from fleeing um, west any farther. It's a literal symbol of the division, of the divide, of the oppression of um, the Cold War. And that's an important thing to remember as we come back to it. So all these people start protesting. They start leaving the country. The government leaders, they basically give up and resign. Why? Just like we've seen before, they have no support. No one in East Germany is really on their side. And the Soviet Union is like, sorry, guys, you're on your own once again. And that brings us to November 9th, 1989, when the Berlin Wall, that hated symbol of division, is torn down. Um, it's actually a little bit of a miscommunication for what happens there. Um, there is a memo in which East German government leaders are discussing the fact that East Germans are trying to travel more between East and West Germany, that they're going through Czechoslovakia, which you can kind of see, you know, they're going from Czechoslovakia to West Germany. So they're talking like, oh, look, they can, 
go to West Germany. Um, and somehow this memo gets mistranslated, mistranscribed, um, and then gets put out to the public where people in Berlin here hear, yeah, you can go to West Berlin. We're going to take down the wall. And everyone's like, cool, let's take down the wall. So they start gathering at the wall and literally start taking axes and hammers to the wall and start tearing it down by their own hand. And within hours, you have hundreds and thousands of people on both sides because the West Germans are like, what's happening? And then they go to the wall. And now East Germans and West Germans are tearing down this hated symbol, um, which is really special. Um, and really exciting. Google, you know, the tearing of the wall and you can just see the jubilation and the excitement on people's faces because this is truly one of the most iconic symbols of the Cold War and of this division. And it is being torn down by people, by their own bare hands. Um, also, David Hasselhoff had saying on it, but that's a story for another day. <clears throat> so... The culmination of this tearing down the wall is that Germany is going to be reunified. East Germany, West Germany disappear, and now we just have one large Germany, which is pretty exciting. All right, so that is what is going on with the satellite states. So now we have our two factors that are ending the Soviet Union. We see that the economy is unable to maintain um, control of its own people and we'll come back to that and then we also see the satellite states in eastern europe that are breaking away and the major allies of the soviet union are now leaving them what is america doing at this time we know that america is increasing tensions because we know detente fell um failed we know that the salt treaties failed we know that um there's a lot of distrust between the two nations um America is also secretly supporting the Afghans in the Soviet-Afghan war. So as I mentioned before, the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan because they're trying to extend their control in Central Asia, but you never start a land war in Asia. Um, so they're fighting against the Afghanis. So America gets wind of this, and they start secretly sending funds, they start sending arms, they start sending the CIA to train the Afghani fighters, who are known as the Muhajirin, which I am totally butchering. Um, so America basically goes into Afghanistan. It's like Afghanistan, we got your back. We will help you fight the Soviet Union. This becomes a proxy war. Um, so we train all these Afghani fighters. And one interesting thing to note uh, about this is um, one of those fighters that um, we train is a man by the name of Osama bin Laden. That's right. He was fighting in Afghanistan in the 1980s. He was trained by the CIA. He received aid um, by the CIA and, um, you know, obviously did not have plans to create Al-Qaeda and, you know, head the 9-11 terrorist attacks at that time. But, you know, it's an interesting twist of fate. Um, after Afghanistan um, was able to defeat the Soviets and kick them out, um, then Afghanistan basically... Um, crumbled into control by warlords and then Osama bin Laden goes to Saudi Arabia and gets super radicalized and that's a story for another day. Um, so America is secretly supporting the Afghanis. At the same time we're also um, all up in Latin America supporting those anti-communist activities um, like in Nicaragua etc. Um, America is also going to be publicly supporting Eastern European protest movements. So as I mentioned President Reagan. Um, he's on the television being like, Lech Valencia, you're doing great. East Germans, you keep protesting. In fact, in 1987, President Reagan has a very famous speech in which he, on television, says, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall! And then a couple of years later, when the Germans actually tear it down, Ronald Reagan's like, look what I did! I'm amazing! Um, good old Ronald Reagan. Um, one of the most interesting programs that Ronald Reagan has is the Strategic Defense Initiative. Um, Ronald Reagan was a B-movie actor in the 1950s. That's where he got his start. He was in Hollywood. Um, and then following his time in Hollywood, then he became governor of California um, and then ultimately was elected president in 1980. But Ronald Reagan started in a bunch of movies. Um, and one of the movies he starred in was this space movie in which he was like the captain of a spaceship and they're fighting against aliens. And in this movie, they had this technology which they could create a giant force field that would protect their spaceship and protect like parts of planets or whatnot, 
from alien warfare and from alien fighting. So Ronald Reagan, this is not a joke, Ronald Reagan, when he was president, goes to Secretary of Defense and goes to, you know, um, CIA and whomever. And it's like, you guys, I have a great idea. Let's build a giant force field sh satellite shield using satellites that when the Soviets, when they launch their missiles, we can turn it on and then we'll be protected. Be like a giant dome over America. So it won't matter if the Soviets build 8 million missiles, nuclear weapons, etc. We'll be protected because we'll have a giant shield around us. Isn't that amazing? Well, it is amazing. Um, except that is completely... You can't actually do that. Like, there's no science to protect it. And also, it totally is a symbol of the lack of trust. Like, it totally makes us look like we totally don't trust the Soviet Union. Which we didn't. Because remember, Ronald Reagan calls the Soviet Union publicly the evil empire. So it's just an obvious symbol of the increased tensions of um, between America and the Soviet Union at this time. Um, and also, I just think it's amazing because Ronald Reagan was like, I have this cool idea. It's from a movie I was in. Let's make that public policy. So that is um, what's going on with Ronald Reagan in America. So America is basically like the thorn in the Soviet Union side right now, just kind of like digging in salt on the wound. Like, yeah, we'll help the Afghanis. Yeah, we'll support the Eastern Europeans because, yeah, we'll build this shield around us to protect us from your missiles. Um, just really unsupportive of um, the Soviet Union, which is going to kind of lead to the end of it. So now the Soviet Union, they've lost basically all their allies. Um, they broke up with China years ago, so they don't have Chinese support. They've lost Eastern Europe. They don't really have any other major communist allies. There's not really other major um, communist nations at this time. You know, what do they have? They have Cuba, which is a tiny island nation. They're not going to be able to keep them afloat. <laughs> See what I did there? They're an island. Um, as well as other nations like Vietnam and Laos, North Korea. That's not really going to help them out. So there's not really a lot of support for the Soviet Union, um, which is going to lead to the end of it. Let's talk about what's going on internally. We're in the home stretch, you guys. You're doing great. So internally, we're seeing a lot of regional unrest. Um, that's largely due to the fact that there are a lot of non-Russian ethnic groups in Russia, in the Soviet Union, sorry, um, that are fed up. They want self-rule. They don't identify with the Soviet Union, with Russian culture. When Lenin um, creates the Soviet Union, when he's the head of it, he actually outlaws um, a lot of cultural identity. So you're no longer really allowed to speak your own language. You're not allowed to practice your own religion. Um, religion is totally outlawed. And you're not allowed to practice um, any of your own customs. If you saw um, Fiddler on the Roof last year, uh, the pogrom at the end of the musical when the Russians, sorry if I'm ruining this for anyone, spoiler alert, um, when the Russians come in and basically force the Jewish villagers to flee, um, that's an example of the Russians basically being like, you can't practice your own religion any longer. You can't do whatever you want. Um, you have to speak Russian. Lenin also was super shady and he would actually move people. So he moved people from like the Stans in Central Asia and moved them up to um, the Baltic states here and like moved people around. So people didn't even have their own community any longer, um, which would make it more difficult for them to unify and oppose him. So it was pretty messed up. Um, but by the 1980s, um, a lot of these regions are just really realizing that they don't identify and therefore they don't want to be part of this country any longer. This should be ringing some bells. This is a very familiar story. A group of people in a large empire that don't identify with the empire's ruling government and therefore want their own country. We saw that with the Bosnians and the Serbs in Austro-Hungarian empire, empire even. Um, we see influences of self-determination of Woodrow Wilson. We see similar stories with decolonization. Um, very similar things happening here in which countries want independence, which people will want to break away from countries which they don't identify with. Um, <clears throat> that's going to culminate in 1990 when Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania here all declare independence from the Soviet Union. They say, we've been Soviet Socialist Republics, but we don't identify, we don't want to be part of it, um, so we're going to instead declare independence. In Estonia, actually, um, this little tiny nation, 
um, the people in Estonia all, um, they start like a singing protest in which people go out in the street and just sing like Estonian folk songs, which had been outlawed. Um, and literally like hundreds of thousands of them are all like holding hands and like singing in the streets went on. It becomes like this giant, once again, a nice peaceful protest. Um, and Moscow just can't maintain control. So they kind of have to give in. Um, <clears throat> again, why, why is the Soviet Union allowing this to happen? Why is Russia not fighting Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania more? They can't afford to. They have no resources. Remember, their economy is terrible. Oops, sorry. Um, so they liter literally don't have the ability to maintain control of, um, of these republics and force them to stay. Um, and just to give you a sense of once again, kind of this nationalist spirit of um, people wanting to be independent. So the yellow here, that's going to be your Slavics. That's going to be your Russians. All these other colors that we see, especially along the edges here, these are all different ethnic groups that don't identify with Russia and don't want to be a part of Russia any longer. So again, that nationalist spirit that we've been talking about basically every other day we talk about nationalism, we're seeing it again. All right. And that brings us to this man right here, Mikhail Gorbachev. He's our final Soviet premier, the final head of the Soviet government. Um, we talked about Stalin. We've talked about Khrushchev. There's a couple other ones in between. There's Brezhnev. There's an Andropov. There's a Europov, maybe. Probably another one or two. And then finally, Gorbachev. Mikhail. Gorby, as he's known in the West. Um, he's elected in 1985. It's a nice, young, brash, new premier. Um, he is going to bring around a lot of change. Just like we saw with Khrushchev denouncing Stalin, just like we saw with Deng Xiaoping denouncing some of Mao's stuff, Gorbachev's going to do the same thing. It's going to be like that Brezhnev doctrine, in which if people want to protest and want freedoms, um, and then we will crush it, we're not going to do that so much in which we're going to fight in other countries and force to spread communism around the world, we're not going to do that so much. This whole tensions with America, we're not going to do that so much. Why is he saying this? Because he loves freedom and democracy. Or he realizes that the Soviet Union can't afford to do these things any longer. So it's there's multiple reasons for that. Gorbachev, I do believe, wanted to increase, you know, democracy, increase freedoms. But he also realized that Soviet Union, Soviet Union just could not do that. Um, so it's going to help reduce the tensions. He actually, um, with America, despite the fact that Ronald Reagan for the past five years is calling the Soviet Union the evil umpire nonstop, um, he and Ronald Reagan actually get along pretty well. And Ronald Reagan uh, liked to call him Gorby a lot, too, um, which... It's just fun to think about our political leaders and their fun nicknames. All right, so what does Gorby do? He comes up with several programs to um, bring freedoms to the Soviet Union. <clears throat> the first of which is Glasnost. Glasnost literally means openness. So there, you're learning some fun Russian words today. Um, he's going to end censorship. and He's going to allow people to have political uh, dissent and allow people to question the government. What a crazy idea. Um, so people actually for the first time have some freedom for the first time ever, because prior to this Russian revolution, remember Russia was an autocratic state where there's no questioning of the czar and then there's no questioning of Lenin and there was definitely no question of Stalin or Khrushchev. And now you can finally, this is major. The other major thing that um, Glasnost does is that it's going to reopen the churches because remember, under the Soviet Union, it is illegal to practice religion. Why? Because the Soviet Union is your god under um, during this time. So Stalin, Khrushchev, etc., they don't want to compete with some sort of religious fervor or um, compete with anything else. But Gorbachev is going to allow that. Gorbachev is going to realize that people are still practicing. It's just in secret. So instead, he is going to have the government support that, which is a pretty major change. Um, another major change um, Gorbachev does is this perestroika, which is a restructuring. It restructures the government and the economy. 
It's going to reduce the government size as well as allow private ownership. Why does he do this? Because the government can't afford to run as it is. There's so much bureaucracy. There's so many, um, so many people in the government that are just not doing anything. Um, so Gorbachev basically streamlines the government to try to make it more effective and more functional. Um, in addition to try to help the economy, um, because remember it's being it's going terribly by now. Um, he's hoping that allowing some private ownership will. Um, increase the economy and help it grow. And then finally, Gorbachev is going to bring in some democratization. He's going to allow voters to choose their own candidates, which sounds like a funny thing. Um, but <clears throat> it's important to note that during this time in the Soviet Union, um, they had elections, you know, just like all the other countries, there were elections. But the way their elections worked were that the um, Communist Party would tell you who your candidates were. So you could choose candidate A, who was a party member, or you could choose candidate B, who was a party member. Or in many cases, you could choose candidate A, because that was your only choice. Um, so despite the fact that there are elections, they're not really free or fair or democratic. Um, but now Gorbachev is going to actually allow people to nominate um, people themselves and come up with their own list of candidates, which is um, pretty exciting. It's also something um, that we're hearing about in the news now um, with Hong Kong. So as we know, Hong Kong, which had been kind of its own um, protectorate state under the, the British and then was given back to China um, several years ago now. Uh, a couple years ago, um, they were having their elections and the Chinese Communist Party does this as well, where they'll be like, here, here's five candidates. They're all from our party, so choose your favorite. Um, and um, they did that in Hong Kong about, I think, about two years ago, whatnot. Um, and people in Hong Kong were like, uh, that's not how democracy works, China. That's not really what we've been used to. And they actually started a major protest. It was called the Umbrella Protests, um, in which they were protesting to have the ability to choose and nominate their own candidates. Um, it didn't really work, unfortunately, but um, it's important to pay attention to because we'll see continuing kind of what goes on with Hong Kong in those protests. Um, but again, we can kind of see these patterns emerge um, decades prior in the Soviet Union. All right, and that brings us to 1991, which is the last year of the Soviet Union. So if you're loving the Soviet Union, this is the last year to really soak it up. So what happens? A man named Boris Yeltsin, this guy right here, he's elected president. What happened to Gorbachev, you're wondering? Gorbachev is still the premier. So in the Soviet Union, they have kind of this dual... Um, leadership in which Boris Yeltsin, he's the president of Russia. And then Gorbachev, he is the Soviet premier of the Soviet uh, Union. And they work together because Russia and Soviet Union are kind of synonymous. Um, and they work together to incorporate all those democratic movements. So Perestroika and Glasnost, um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeltsin is on board. They're working with it. However, there are a lot of Soviets who are not excited about this. They don't like Glasnost. They don't like perestroika. They don't like democracy or freedom. They like totalitarianism. So at one point in August, Gorbachev, he's at his summer house hanging out, doing his summer house things. Um, and the Soviet hardliners, um, many of whom are in the army, they go around and they basically place Gorbachev under house arrest. Um, and in addition, they sent armed forces to occupy Moscow and occupy the Kremlin, the government building there. Um, and they're like, we're taking over the country. We're going back to totalitarianism. None of this crazy democracy. It fails in two days. Nobody supports them. Um, all these Soviet hardliners are like, yeah, everyone's going to be on our side. It's going to be awesome. Except that does not happen because um, the people are like, um, no, we like what Gorbachev and Yeltsin are doing. We don't want what you're doing. So it totally fails. And this failure, it's the end. People realize the writing's on the walls. All of Eastern Europe is now independent. We have uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania declaring independence. Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan are all clamoring for independence. And it's just, it's done. The Soviet Union is not going to be able to exist for much longer. <clears throat> Um, so as I said, many more Soviet republics declare their independence um, in 
the fall and early winter of 1991. And on December 25th, once again, Christmas Day, as a gift to the world, the Soviet Union formally dissolves and it is no more. Um, the great dream of Lenin and Stalin and the nightmare of so many Soviet peoples has officially come to a close. Um, these 15 former Soviet socialist republics are now independent states. They're their own sovereign nations. Um, they are still um, connected. Um, they form the Commonwealth of Independent States, um, similar to the Commonwealth of the former British Empire, so like Canada and Australia. Um, you know, they're their own independent nations, but they still share um, some commonalities and they share some diplomatic connections. So they still meet um, and kind of get together and, you know, agree to certain things. Um, Boris Yeltsin, he now becomes president of Russia, only Russia, nothing else. Um, and these former republics, they elect their own government leaders um, and create their own structures. Um, most of them embrace aspects of democracy. Some of them at times become um, more uh, dictatorial. Um, unfortunately, that's more the case um, than... <clears throat> That's often more the case now than in times past, which is unfortunate. Um, so now these former Soviet Socialist Republics, Soviet Union used to be all of this and all of these countries here. Now it's these 15 independent states, which is pretty amazing. This is not something that people thought would happen in their lifetimes. I remember actually being a young kid and I remember my mother um, looking at this map or a map like this um, in the newspaper and I just remember her sitting at the kitchen table just being completely floored and saying I never thought this would happen in my lifetime because she had grown up in her entire lifetime with the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union was such this mythological beast in Americans minds we were so fearful of it and rightly so because of the fears of nuclear holocaust um, but fearful of how powerful and how massive it was and then it was just no more Within a matter of months, it just completely crumbled and dissolved. This is a major, major political shift. Just as large, if not in some respects larger, than the French Revolution, than the world wars um, that we've talked about. It has major long-lasting effects. Um, let's talk briefly just a little bit about Russia. We're not going to go in crazy great detail. Um, you are nearing the end. But just to give us a sense of what's happening in Russia, because we're going to see some themes emerge um, that reflect themes that we've seen before and will continue to um, reinforce things as we'll talk about in the future. So after the end of the Soviet Union, um, because the country goes from Soviet Union to these new nations, um, they go from communism to now suddenly capitalism, the economy tanks. Everything goes haywire. It's super crazy. So Boris Yeltsin, this cool guy right here, he uses a shock therapy to bring in free market economy, to bring in capitalism. Because remember, nobody's had private ownership. Nobody's had competition. The state has given you everything um, and you have been beholden to the state. And all of a sudden, now people own bread and they're selling the bread and people own the materials and now they're selling and they're working for wages. And it's just insanity. Um, so Yeltsin, what does he do? He tries to reduce trade barriers and remove price control. So he's like, we'll just go full free market capitalism. Um, there's a belief that if everybody is buying and selling, it will all balance itself out. That does not happen. Um, instead, there's major increased unemployment. There's major economic downturn. Um, it's real bad. Um, and Boris Yeltsin is just not looking too good. Boris Yeltsin also during this time um, comes to America in the 1990s um, to meet with President Clinton and like discuss like new diplomatic relations. Um, in addition to making really terrible decisions about the economy of Russia, and we'll see about the politics of Russia, he also makes terrible life decisions. Um, and in fact, at one point, he almost starts an international incident because he is found by our Secret Service wandering the streets of Washington, D.C. at 2 in the morning trying to hail a cab so he can go get pizza clad only in his underwear because he is so drunk that he has somehow managed to escape his secret service um, and 
desperately wants pizza um, and is literally wanting the streets. And it's amazing that nothing bad happened to him. Like he wasn't, you know, <laughs> mugged on the streets or lost or anything else. Uh, but fortunately, the Secret Service was able to take him back to his hotel, get him his clothes, and maybe even get him some pizza as well. Um, continuing on Boris Yeltsin, continuing with political issues. Um, one just kind of thing to note, what else is going on in Russia? Um, they're their own country, but there still are a lot of parts of Russia, especially in southwestern Russia here, who want to declare their own independence. There's a lot of little mini wannabe nation states. One of the biggest, and I think one of the most synonymous, is Chechnya, which is actually a Muslim region in southwestern um, Russia. They declare their independence um, in the early 90s and say, we're independent, just like Estonia and just like Moldova. Um, except unlike those nations, Yeltsin says, no, you're not, and instead sends in troops um, and turns to lots of fighting. The fighting continues off and on to this day. Um, the Chechen rebels um, at times use a lot of um, really violent tactics. If you remember the Boston um, Marathon bombings of a couple of years ago, um, the brothers that were responsible for the bombings were Chechen. Um, and it was partly due to um, their Chechen identity and um, what the Chechens wanted that um, led them to have that attack. So it's unfortunate that America, um, you know, we're feeling the effects of this as well. Um, so Yeltsin, just making terrible decisions all over the place. Um, he finally resigns in 1999 and he's replaced by a man who we're all familiar with, this guy right here, good old Mr. Putin. Um, who's basically been in control of the government ever since, um, which is important to note. Vladimir Putin has been in control of Russia longer than you have been alive. Um, now, how does this happen, you might wonder. Doesn't Russia is in a democracy? Don't they have elections? Why are people choosing him? I don't understand. So um, what happens is Vladimir Putin, he was elected president or created president, um, and in Russia, they have president and prime minister, and president then elects his prime minister. So then he elected his friend, um, Vladimir, Igor, I don't know the first name, Med Medvedev, um, and then they rule the government. And then in the next elections, Medvedev is elected, and then he appoints Putin to be prime minister. And then the next elections, Putin is now president, and they basically just go back and forth, back and forth. And isn't it so interesting that all the Russians vote for these men? Huh. How interesting. Oh, Russia. Russia and elections. So many questions. So many questions. All right. So finally, where does this leave us? What are these legacies of the Cold War? We're on our penultimate slide. We see uh, many economic struggles, as I just mentioned. It's these communist nations now attempt to go to capitalism. Everything goes crazy. In addition, because these communist nations have been so focused on military production um, and building things for the state. There's nothing for the consumers. There's nothing for the people, uh, which puts people in really bad positions. Uh, this leads to a lot of political upheaval, a um, lot of instability, a lot of changes, a lot of coups, a lot of power vacuums. We know when there's power vacuums, that's going to lead to dictators. Um, and some leaders are still practicing a lot of Soviet era techniques. Um, so there's a lot of um, authoritarian control. Um, for example, we see dictatorships arise in Belarus and a lot of the Stans, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, etc. Um, a lot of these leaders are really, really brutal. Um, and even though they're independent democratic nations, they might as well just be part of the Soviet Union for all of their practices with all the censorship um, and propaganda. It's really, really brutal. And unsurprisingly, this leads to a lot of social struggles. We see a lot of ethnic minorities being persecuted by majorities. Um, these tensions were there during the Soviet Union, but now that there's freedom, now there's competition for who can control the government, um, that's going to lead to, at times, outright warfare as well as terrible things like ethnic cleansing and genocides. So when you're looking at this, this these should not be new ideas because we're seeing similar themes. When we think about decolonization and the legacies of colonialism and the struggles that new nations in Asia and Africa faced, um, when we look at countries and how they struggle after the end of the Cold War, etc., we're seeing a lot of similar ideas. That this political instability combined with poor economy makes people be unsatisfied, 
leads to lots of change, leads to lots of coups, leads to lots of um, oftentimes devastation for the peoples. So finally, what are our final legacies of the Cold War? Well, America, I guess, wins the Cold War, mostly because the Soviet Union no longer exists, so they win by de facto. Go America, we're just winning everything. Um, Asia is continuing to grow economically, becoming globally dominant, replacing America and the Soviet Union um, as the superpowers. Now we kind of have a new super region. And the rest of the globe, Latin America, and Middle East, and Africa are still dealing with the repercussions of the Cold War, these proxy wars, as well as recent conflicts, as well as all the political instability. And that is where I'm going to leave you. Congratulations. You now know why the Cold War ended and how it ended, which is pretty exciting. When I was in high school, I never learned about it. I learned about the Cold War, and then apparently it ended, but nobody ever told me how. So you cannot say the same. Um, you're welcome. But um, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I hope you got a lot out of it. Um, in class, we will continue to reinforce our knowledge about this um, exciting topic. So congratulations. You are done. Thank <laughs> you.